That for me is a small but significant indicator of some of the challenges of managing even one domain of your sovereignty, protecting your maritime and physical space. If you can't do that on your own, how sovereign is your sovereignty? How independent is your independence? Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Rashi Griffith Show. Today, I am joined for the second time by Dr. Ifla Griffith, who is a fellow of the Caribbean Policy Consortium and of Global Americas, and also a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Today, we are going to be discussing Dr. Griffith's new book, Challenge Sovereignty, The Impact of Drugs, Crime, Terrorism, and Cyber Threats in the Caribbean. Good afternoon, Dr. Griffith. Good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you are. It's morning here in Long Island. Afternoon here in Madrid. So I want to get into the conversation by coming approaching from a more general question of sovereignty in the Caribbean, which can, in a later part of the conversation, approach the sovereignty of small states in general and in theory. A few months ago, the former premier of the BVI, British Virgin Islands, was convicted in the US on charges of drug trafficking. Now, there are many other times in the past, similar things have happened. But in this instance, Britain stepped in to suspend many elements of local governance in the BVI, and they almost approached it where they were going to take back direct rule of the BVI, similar to what they have done a decade ago in Turks and Caicos, for example, for a different corruption scandal that happened there. And even in the Caribbean, in countries that have this direct link to Britain, who are not fully independent, they also have this sovereignty crisis as well. So is there actually a hope for small, fully independent Caribbean countries to overcome these state capacity corruption problems and actually take full advantage of the sovereignty they have? Rashi, let me begin by thanking you for the opportunity to chat about the book in relation to the issues in it. But as is the case often with any book, there are other tangential issues that may become part of the conversation. There are several ways you can approach the question you just posed. A short answer or a long answer? A short answer very often is not helpful because short answers do not allow the context that is required to be helpful to be offered. So I'm going to take the long route to respond to your question. And the long route requires me to step back in time to a couple of centuries ago, to 1648. Why 1648, you may ask? 1648 was a defining year in international relation. It was the year when a series of conferences in Westphalia, ending the 30-year European war, led to this notion of sovereignty, the traditional sovereignty notion being that here you have in the international arena, independent actors called sovereign states who pursue their national interests without anybody telling them how to pursue that national interest, unless they give the right to others to help determine what those interests are. Now, when those notion, when that notion of sovereignty was developed, there were no Caribbean countries as we know them. Over time, you had not only a colonization rollback with decolonization and independent countries being formed, many of which, like the Caribbean, are small, but it came to be recognized relatively quickly that the notion of the 1648 definition of sovereignty in the context of how things have modified and changed over the years, that notion really doesn't apply to many countries, Caribbean and other small countries. And if you look at the combination of forces, development, circumstances, particularly in the 20th century, the 21st century, you find it increasingly difficult for Caribbean and other small countries to want to hold on to that notion of sovereignty. And so, Over the years, as I looked at the challenges in the Caribbean and Central America and other small states, 
I found the necessity not only to rethink that 1648 traditional Westphalian notion, but to recommend that a different conception of sovereignty that would explain the circumstances of the Caribbean might be a useful thing to do. And that is why in this book, I propose the notion of understanding the circumstances, the sovereignty circumstances of the Caribbean and other small states as being a set of circumstances of what I call a challenge sovereignty. And if you take the notion of challenge sovereignty, even if you were to leave the four areas that I focus on, the four security arenas, drugs, the crime, the cyber threat, and the terrorism, even if you were to take all the issues, let's say climate change, you find that sovereignty as defined way back in 1648 doesn't really apply. And does they really apply, leaving aside the challenges that I mentioned, drugs, crime, terrorism, cyber threats, because individual countries in the Caribbean do not have the capability to really exercise the sovereign authority that is pretended to exist in the traditional notion. I'll give you a couple of examples. I think the wisdom of our fathers, our independence fathers of the Anglophone Caribbean, led to the pursuit of Carifta and ultimately CARICOM. That was a recognition that the individual country's ability was so circumscribed that they needed to have some collaborative, some collective, some cooperation, some regional engagement. But even with the regional engagement, you find that whether it's RSS or CARICOM, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. Individual countries still aren't able to exercise the autonomy that they would like to exercise because of limitations. But you have a factor that you adverted to earlier, and that is the British, the monarchical, the colonial architecture still existing in parts of the Caribbean, further complicating this exercise of sovereignty. And I'll give you two examples. If you go to Trinidad and Tobago, as I'm sure you've gone to many times, you'll find an element of the CARICOM regional architecture called the Caribbean Court of Justice. But when you ask the question, are all CARICOM countries part of this CCJ? The answer is no. You'll find that some of the largest CARICOM countries, including Trinidad, it has been the host of the court from its formation, still is not amenable to investing confidence in the Caribbean regional architecture called the CCG. So that for me is a partly a reflection of this sovereignty is not as real as people would want you to believe. It is challenged in many respects. That's a long-winded answer to your question, Rashid. Okay. Given the inherent challenges, when we are thinking about sovereignty in the Caribbean then, does it make full sense to think about it, to continue to frame it as this extreme autonomy, a radical autonomy that the Caribbean country should have. I make that comment in the context of there doesn't seem to be any credible appetite amongst Caribbean leaders for this idea of proper regional integration, which would destroy some autonomy, but perhaps inculcate and build some sovereignty in kind of your conception here. If you leave aside Haiti, leave aside Cuba, leave aside the Dominican Republic, which has celebrates its independence from Haiti, by and large, the rest of the Caribbean, primarily the Anglophone Caribbean, are really teenagers' independence era. 50 years independence, 60 years, Barbados celebrating its independence, Jamaica celebrating its independence. And in the context of particularly the Eastern Caribbean countries, which became independent in the 70s and the 80s, there is a caught between a rock and a hard place regarding the sovereignty issue. Because of the recency of the independence, the notion of self-determination, there is a reluctance to roll back elements of that independence by collectivizing the sovereignty. It's like a teenager who wants to grow up fast enough to get your own apartment. But then once you get this new apartment, you realize that your earnings are not enough for you to pay all the bills that go with having your own department. If you're still holding on to mommy or daddy or Uncle Joe to help you. And in the context of that torn between a rock and a hard place regarding this self-determination autonomy, I could understand the reluctance to go too fully ahead in 
ceding some sovereignty, even though in the longer term, ceding some of that individual's autonomy would redound to the advantage, to the benefit of the collective in a more significant way. And I am hoping that with the passage of time, you will have a more robust evolution of the regional architecture. For example, I'm hoping within the next few years, as Jamaica has said it will be doing, move out from under the architecture of the monarchy of Britain to become a republic. Barbados did it two years ago. Very good. And I'm hoping that over time, what we know as the Eastern Caribbean independent states will see the necessity to collectivize as one because they aren't able to maintain credible independence by paying the bills, doing all the things needed in foreign policy, in security, all the things need for trade. It's a complex architecture globally. And in many cases, just practicing the science of muddling through to keep this sovereignty ship afloat. And I'm hoping that as the rough waters become more manifest, the rough management of international affairs waters, the rough management of the climate change waters, the countries will see the necessity to really make more robust the regional architecture. Not that the robustness will solve the problems altogether, but it will, in my view, enable them to better manage the circumstances that are presented to them. I'll give you an example of the challenge to sovereignty in the national security arena. A good friend of mine, who at the time was head of the defense force of a certain jurisdiction, I'm not going to name the country, was commiserating with me an embarrassing circumstance that his defense force faced. His Coast Guard was chasing a go-fast drug trafficking operation. They ran out of fuel. They had to be rescued by another Coast Guard. So I said to him, friend, how can you allow this to happen? How can you run out of fuel? The long and short of it, Rashid, they did not even know the fuel gauge in this Coast Guard vessel was broken. They had been operating this Coast Guard vessel, which was a gift. Matter of fact, all the Coast Guard vessels were gifts, but with the gift did not come maintenance funding. So given the funding limitations of this country, and it's not unique to this particular country, they had been just using these vessels without maintaining them properly. They didn't even know if you fuel gate was broken. So they were operating. Matter of fact, they were relying upon another jurisdiction to provide the fuel for their Coast Guard operation. That for me is a small but significant indicator of some of the challenges of managing even one domain of your sovereignty, protecting your maritime and physical space. If you can't do that on your own, how sovereign is your sovereignty? How independent is your independence? So I'm hoping that over the passage of time, the circumstances will force more countries to more robustly engage the regional architecture and evolve to the point where you have a unified state, if not in the entire Caribbean Anglophone, at least in the Eastern Caribbean countries, because sovereignty is not sovereign. Why are you optimistic about that point, given that back in 1950s, when you had the Federation movement of British West Indies, that was the high point of any kind of Caribbean integration, and we've not come anywhere close to that since then. But since then, we have had more Caribbean countries that are republics. All the newest is Barbados, we have Guyana, you have Dominica, you have Trinidad, but even then, there hasn't been any actual forward movement towards real integration. Why are you optimistic that this could happen in the near future? It's not for me, Rashid, a case of optimism. It's a case of hopefulness. I am hopeful that the circumstances that over the years are making it patent that business as usual cannot continue as usual will force them to realize that you've got to do something different. You've got to make some hard decisions and tell your people some uncomfortable truths. I remember saying to a group, I was at National Defense University two weeks ago and speaking to a course in officers from the Caribbean Basin. And I made a point in a sidebar conversation with some of the officers. I said, if the citizens of some Caribbean countries really get the real skinny and who pays the bills for their independent 
police forces, defense forces, coast guards, they'll be pretty upset with their political leaders because the leaders are giving them the impression that they're taking care of business. But the business is being funded by the Americans. It's been funded by the European Union, by the British, by the Spanish. It is a pretense to managing our affairs, fully conscious as they are, that they are not managing these affairs. They are being funded, subsidized. So for me, I'm hoping that the circumstances of concatenation of events, of developments, the combination of that set of events with the reluctance on the part of some donors to keep giving the way they have been giving, you force countries to realize that we got to do something differently. So it's not so much an optimism as it is a hopefulness that there will be an evolution over time, forcing them to come to terms in a certain different way. Why do you think that this level of intense insularity developed in the Caribbean over the last 50 or so years? In my generation, I'm 30 years old on the younger side, and people generally around my age don't have any concept of interest in Caribbean integration, the average person, where I feel that when I speak to people more in your generation, there's a stronger interest in Caribbean integration. Something happened over the last like 40, 50 years where I would have expected the my generation to be much more gun ho about integration. But it's the opposite. Do you have an answer for that? I do. Remember what was the seminal occurrence in the global arena after the end of the Second World War? You had the collapse of empires manifested in this whole movement called decolonization. You had a significant interest in self-determination reflected in independence. And so in the 50s, beginning with Ghana, actually going back to India in the 1948, and moving on to the African continent, moving into the Caribbean in the 1960s, you had an intellectual and political ferment around decolonization, an intellectual and a political and academic ferment around self-determination against anti-colonialism, against anti, in relation to anti-imperialism. All of those things were successful to degrees, allowing for more nation states to be created, allowing for more conversations and articles and books. But over time, as more became independent and a waning of the decolonization movement, there was less anxiety in people in your generation. The memories are not as strong about decolonization, about independence. The protests that led to the change, some of it very violent in Jamaica, in Guyana, less so in Barbados and, and the Eastern Caribbean. So I think you had a passage of time with circumstances that over time became less resonant with the younger folks. That, for me, is an important contribution. Now, simultaneously, you had in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, at the global level, in the context of the Cold War, you had not only the East-West notions, but you had this movement for a non-alignment. Guyana, Indonesia, Egypt, Yugoslavia, a number of countries, trying to find a way to build a way of managing a path outside the East and outside the West, even though there were many contradictions in that non-aligned movement. But when last have you heard anything about an online movement? A couple of years ago, they had a conference in Venezuela. Who, who showed up for it? So if you take that success of the decolonization effort, you take a resurgence of all the interest in independence, self-determination, but the success of that resurgence leading to more countries and a lessening of the anxiety for the remaining entities that are colonies to become free. Yes, you still have in French Guiana, which is the département d'automé of France, you still have protest movements, but you don't have a press for independence. You ask people in Turks and Caicos, they're happy with being a British colony. Same as the Cayman Islands. And that combination of things, starting with the 1940s, India's movement, Ghana in 1954, Caribbean countries in the 60s and the 70s. Over time, there's a lessening of the interest and anxiety in this business of self-determination, things of that kind. I think that's part of the explanation for the dynamic differences generationally. 
It seems to me a situation in Caribbean where I tend to phrase it as this way. There are less political questions in the Caribbean than other places. In the sense that in the Caribbean, people talk as if politics has ended, that the current orientation of the Caribbean countries, the current way they're managed, that is just the end of history. And the only thing to debate is who actually name is on the paper that we stamp and call a prime minister or a president. There's no conversation really about how to organize government. There's no conversation really about how to integrate properly and so on. All these things are essentially empty. There are no more politics questions of that sort. And that seems to become a very uniquely Caribbean problem, at least from my perspective, because in Europe, everything is in flux. In Latin America, you're still having a conversation every day. North America, Asia. But in the Caribbean, it just seems like we stopped talking about politics as actual grand design and only as some technocratic management system. I think there's an element of truth in that observation, Rashid. The discourse, the nomenclature of the discourse has shifted, and not only in the Caribbean. It shifted from the politics as pursuit of contestation for power to governance. How do we get the political systems bureaucracy to work more efficiently? How do we manage the circumstances, whether the circumstances are healthcare, Circumstances are housing, portable water supply, foreign affairs. The discourse, the narrative being framed as a governance, in some respects, attenuates the edges of the politics discourse. Part of the reality, too, is that the politics of the 60s, of the 70s, had an accompaniment with visual, physical protest in a way in which you don't have the visual, physical protest as part of the governance conversation. There are some outliers, Haiti is an outlier in, the, in some respects in that regard. Jamaica, you take the last two decades, has been an outlier in that respect. But I think by and large, the reframing of the narrative as a governance rather than a politics of protest, the politics of seeking who will have contestation and success in that contestation, especially when the success, when the contestations modalities involve physical protests, sometimes violent protests, not simply what Walter Rodney called groundings, but going beyond the groundings to get up off the ground and do something in a very significant physical, violent sometimes way. Now that is not necessarily a bad thing because hopefully the conversations about governance framed in a civil environment will allow for more listening and learning rather than just foisting views, notions of some leaders, whether in the political sphere or the civic sphere, on citizens writ large. Those are some of the explanations, in my view, for the circumstances that we find in the region. So I want to shift to narco trafficking in the Caribbean. Now, when I speak to my friends in the Caribbean and just people in general, unless you're a Jamaican or a Trinidadian, but it's definitely if you're Barbadian or Solution, you don't really think about narco trafficking as a material problem in the Caribbean. Although by every data point, it is. I've always found that very interesting. Even for me, growing up in Barbados, I never really thought about narco-trafficking as a real issue that we even need to think about. Now, of looking back, that was clearly wrong. I saw that in 2020, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration estimated that around 24% of all cocaine movement in the Western Hemisphere passes through the Caribbean Sea, which is actually down from a higher point in the 80s. That's a very large portion. Well, how did it come to be that the Caribbean became such a hub and nexus of the global drug trafficking trade? Let me take your combination of questions in two baskets. Uh, the first basket is what I would call a definition of the problem basket. Why is it Caribbean countries, except a few, didn't really define this narco problem, narco trafficking is a problem. And then the second basket about location of the Caribbean vis-a-vis -vis the global trade. The chapter on drugs in the Challenge Sovereignty book begins with an epigraph from Peter Tosh, 
Peter Tosh's 1975 anthem, Legalize It. And if you read the lyrics of Peter Tosh's Legalize It, he was advocating two things. He was advocating the societies of the region and beyond the region need to take a different approach to this business of ganja marijuana. And why he was advocating that? He was advocating because his second argument was that the ganja has a lot of benefits to individuals and the society. The reality is that what Peter Tosh was advocating, and along with Bob Marley and many others in the 60s and the 70s, some of that has come to pass even in the great United States in the 2000s. 48 states in the United States and the District of Columbia have now legalized marijuana for medicinal and recreation purposes. What Peter Tosh and Bob Marley and the other were, others were arguing was that this notion of labeling marijuana as a bad thing, lumping it with the other bad things like the cocaine and methamphetamines and the ecstasy is not something that we should embrace. And most Caribbean citizens did not see the definition of the problem the same way as United States and European countries saw it. So if you go to places, and Barbados did have an opportunity in part in the 80s and the 90s to take a slightly different view about marijuana because they were having a problem with St. Vincent that was exporting a significant amount of marijuana to Barbados, among other places. But you had a different definition of the problem. By and large, Caribbean countries did not see, Caribbean citizens did not see marijuana as a problem because as to some of the things that Peter Tosh said, it's good for tuberculosis, good for umara composis, it's good for all these things. Now, when you take the narco-trafficking in a broader definitional frame to understand that narco-trafficking is not only involving the substance illegally defined called marijuana. Narco-trafficking involves marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamines, ecstasy. It is in that context of framing, particularly with the hard drugs, Okay, in the crack, the ecstasy, defined essentially by non-Caribbean actors, United States and European actors primarily, that narco-trafficking was a problem for the region for a long time, for many decades, still is. But Rashid, you got to keep in mind that the problem of narco-trafficking was not simply a problem of moving drugs. And we'll come back to that in the locational discussion just now. There were a number of ancillary things that were spin-offs. And I wrote a book in 1997, I still get royalty from it, called Drugs and Security in the Caribbean, Sovereignty on the Siege. And I make the point there that the drug problem is not a one-dimensional problem. It's connected to crime. It's connected to human trafficking. It's connected to money laundering. It's connected to consumption. You know where the crack cocaine started? U.S. Bahamas. Bahamas, yes. The significant amount of cocaine that was coming from Colombia using the geography of the Bahamas to offshore to get to the United States. It became something that others in the Bahamas said, American entrepreneurs found it useful to go there. So I think when you take what the narco-trafficking writ large was all about, it was not simply moving substances. Because of these ancillary problems, you had a package you had a complex matrix, and it is that matrix that was driving, particularly defined by United States and non-Caribbean actors, defining what it is and what to be done about it. Now, let me come quickly to your second basket of issues. If you ask the question, where does most of the world's cocaine originate? The answer is South America. If you ask the question, where does most of the consumption of the world's cocaine happen. It's North America and Europe. And if you take a look at the geography of the world, you'll find that right between this North America and this South America, there was this string of islands called the Caribbean. And if you ask the question, how is it that Caribbean facilitates the shipment and movement to Europe, given the vast geographic distances? You come closely to look to find that there's some Caribbean countries that are intimately politically connected to Europe. Martinique, Guadeloupe, French Guiana, our depart the Netherlands, Antilles. I gave a lecture to the Dutch foreign ministry a couple of uh, months ago, excited about the importance of the Dutch Antilles to the Netherlands. So if you ask those questions, 
you begin to see that the location of the Caribbean has been for a variety of countries concerned with the drugs issue, a significant explanatory element of why the Caribbean countries are caught up in this. Well, you put along other elements in that matrix, elements that say the Caribbean countries that are involved in this don't have sufficient capabilities for their coast guards, for the defense forces, for their police forces. And so their ability to manage by themselves is severely compromised. As a matter of fact, even if they were able to manage by themselves, the transnational character of the operation is not amenable to any one country or group of countries, you've got to collaborate. And it is that transnationality, along with the capability limitations of Caribbean countries, that allows for the necessity, that explains the necessity for the globalization of the drugs realities where the Caribbean are significantly part of the player. Now, let me mention one other thing that is a connected tissue. Part of the narco-trafficking involves arms trafficking, and it is connected to the criminality, both protecting turf, defending your turf, eliminating opponents. And so Caribbean countries feature in that movement as well, in both in the Drugs and Security book and the Challenge Sovereignty book. I give an anecdote, a personal anecdote that explains why in looking at the narco-trafficking businesses, you've got to not only look at the cartels or the posses, you've got to look at how the entrepreneurship involved has allowed for a number of subcontractors. And significant among those subcontractors are people from Africa. A number of times still today, Nigerians were significant contractors going to South America, moving the drugs either to Africa or to Europe or moving directly to the Caribbean. And in the 1990s, there were a group of us Latin American and Caribbean scholars had these biannual meetings in different parts of South America and the Caribbean. My wife used to say, you're going from country to country, drinking rum and having fun and pretending you're talking about security. And we were meeting in Ecuador. It was 1996. Two-day meeting. So I traveled lightly. I was living in Miami at the time, teaching at FIU. Travel lightly. I'm taking the first flight out of Quito, coming back to the United States. I check in, but before I can get to immigration, I'm pulled over by the narco police at the airport. Pat down, search. I tell the story in detail in the book. At the end of the whole process, I asked the, the captain in charge, help me understand why you select me. I didn't see anybody else pulled out. He began to explain what I had learned intellectually happening already, that they had been having in Quito and other parts of Ecuador, an upsurge of Nigerian who were moving product out of Ecuador, product that would come from other parts of South America, moving them either to Europe or to Africa to traffic. So when you take a broader portrait of the phenomenon, you'll see it is a multidimensional transnational reality. And if you were to define it only in one set of terms, you miss the connectivity in the picture of the broader reality. So that is why it's such a complicated problem, because you have the transnational nature of the operation, mercantile, trade, so on. But then the actors, the non-state actors involved, are oftentimes larger in power resources than many Caribbean countries. So I want to get there, but I wanted to talk about Douglas Coke a bit in Jamaica. In my memory also, that is one of the first times I was really following narco trafficking problems in the Caribbean. It was like 2010, I believe. And I was like just probably fourth form or late high school. I remember the issue was that, of course, the drugs and so on. But the bigger, larger issue was that Dallas Coke was working with the government in some way or it cahoots the government of Jamaica in some way. And that was the bigger scandal. Could you explain the situation? The Dudas Affair is a potent example of Jamaica's manifestation of the challenge sovereignty. And the challenge sovereignty that I define it going beyond the Westphalian notion of the independent international. I argue that for Caribbean and other small state purposes, you've got to view sovereignty as both international and domestic. And the Dudas Coke Affair was a potent manifestation of the challenge to domestic sovereignty, where the police and the army of Jamaica did not exercise authority over Jamaica's territory, as you would expect, a police force and an army. And that in itself is not only a security-rich small challenge, 
it was a manifestation of the political dimensions of what I call the narcotic. Because, and it did not begin with Dudas, Christopher Dudas Cole. Other dons had alignments with the political parties, the two major political parties. And the dons would guarantee votes. And so the political system had a nexus to the dons, both in relation to enabling them to get or pursue power. But hear this, Rashid. The very political system, insofar as the governmental part is concerned, awarded contracts to do this coke. So he had a legitimate business being spun off of contracts from the government, providing economic and social benefits to society. But he had a political business ensuring votes. You had a conflagration that was just waiting to happen. Do this coke didn't begin the connectivity. It happened that it was played out in a powerful, tangible, demonstrable, volcanic way. And part of the saga manifested not only the elections connectivity. I have in the Drugs and the Challenge Sovereignty book, the treaty signed between the United States and Jamaica in 1983 about extradition. Very reluctantly, the Jamaican government was being forced to actualize that trap, that an extradite. It is that attempt to extradite that precipitated the confluence of the violence and the politics, reflecting not only the challenge to Jamaican sovereignty internationally. It had a treaty, and one party to the treaty said, I want to actualize this for reasons, here's the evidence. But then Jamaican is domestic sovereignty was caught between rocks and many hard places. And you're not the only astute Caribbean citizen who was shocked by that reality. And many Caribbean citizens say, my God, if this could happen in Jamaica, what might be the circumstances of our jurisdiction where the challenges are similar, but not in the same scale? I have a case study, not only the Dudas affair, but I think the same chapter where I look at the Dudas affair, I look at the Trinidad 2011 state of emergency. Trinidad was moving in some similar directions. They hadn't had the same kind of enclaves, except Lavantil and uncertain areas. But Jamaica had a, a more significant set of enclaves that were beyond the ability of the police to go in or the army to go in, unless the, the guns gave permission. So it was a remarkable reflection that the drug business is a multidimensional business, affecting sovereignty not only internationally, but domestically. Reflecting not only something that you mentioned, sometimes the drug guys, the non-state actors have so much potency, so much potential, so much capability, sometimes rivaling the ability of the formal state guys. I'll end on this note. That drugs and security book that I wrote in 1997, I did a lot of field research on it. Part of the field research, I spent three nights aboard a U.S. Coast Guard cutter observing drug interdiction, the Grenada Basin. I stood watching the first night. Those three nights are about traumatic for my wife. And I remember asking the captain of the ship, Captain Zukunft, he later became Admiral Coast Guard Commandant, U.S. Coast Guard. I asked him, what is your greatest pleasure in fighting the drug guys? You know what he said to me? He said, Prof, we fight in the drug guys, but sometimes we're not even able to match the drug guys. The drug guys sometimes had go-fast boats that are faster than the U.S. Coast Guard. Now, this is a U.S. Coast Guard that couldn't keep up with some of the go-fast force because their speed outmatched the Coast Guard. Think of the capability limitations of the Caribbean countries. When I was aboard that Coast Guard cutter, Harriet Lane, it was a multinational drug interdiction. Dutch were there. Small Jamaican, British were there. The lead operators were United States with the biggest assets, and they could not match. So when you think of the capability of the non-state actors vis-a-vis -vis some of the state actors, even an actor as powerful and as big as the United States, the disparities are obvious, are patent. It is simply trying to keep up, sometimes not doing it as well as they would like. <laughs>
There was also an example you gave in the book regarding to Antigua and Barbuda that was, I think, quite telling in terms of the transnational interconnectivity of the arms trade. If you could explain that situation. This goes back a couple of years, decades actually, where, and, and one of the factors in the narco trafficking complex is this factor called corruption. And you had playing out in Antigua Barbuda, the corruption factor where Antigua and Barbuda officials, they have a small defense force and a small coast guard. They allow themselves to be defined as the middlemen. The Medellin cartel needed weapons. You're able to pay off some Antiguan officials to pretend that these weapons are coming to the Antigua Barbuda Defense Force. The weapons came from Israel. Israel is a legitimate arms manufacturer and exporter. But it happened that a couple of years after the exportation phenomenon began to happen, some of the weapons were discovered by the legitimate security forces of Colombia. And when they looked at the weapons, they found markings that suggest these were Israeli made weapons. So they asked Israel for an explanation. Israel said, yeah, we sell them, but we didn't sell them to anybody in Colombia. We sold them to Antigua. And so the Antiguans were obliged to bring in an external investigator, a guy called Blum Cooper. If you read that book, it's about 300 pages, the report of that Blum Cooper investigation. As we say back in Guyana, your skin will grow when you see some of the, <coughs> the revelations of some people who Corrupted for so small a monks. One officer got a jacuzzi. So the corruption factor, along with location and the ability of the bad guys, the Colombians and others, to enable things to happen, that was a sordid episode in Antigua and Barbados history. Thankfully, you have not had, as far as the public evidence, a recurrence of that in other parts of the Caribbean. But I tell in that same drugs and security book, lens of arms trafficking involving Jamaica and other places in the Caribbean. So the arms trafficking is part of the operations. There's a graphic in the challenge sovereignty about the arrests and confiscations in one month in 2022, September of 2022, a combined operation of Interpol and Caricom impacts. You go to that graphic and you'd be astounded as to how many weapons, ammunition, Cocaine collection, marijuana collection, arrests, addition of the continual challenge, sovereignty challenges of the region. One of the most shocking statistics I've ever read, I read it for the first time a couple of years ago, was that Trinidad and Tobago had the highest rate of any Western Hemisphere country for recruitment into ISIS. And... If you tell anyone that outside the Caribbean, they wouldn't even know where to start thinking about that kind of point. But obviously, if me, when I think that, my first thought goes to the coup attempt in Trinidad in the early 90s. So it's me, it's like history, it's like not memory in my part, I wasn't was born yet, it's history. <laughs> but it's also an Islamic situation as well. How careful does the Caribbean actually need to think about this issue of Islamic radicalism and terrorism from potentially in the Caribbean? I took the trouble in the chapter on terrorism and cybercrime to pay the portrait of the terrorism and the role of Trinidad and Tobago supporting the pursuit of ISIS radicalism, ISIS independence. But hopefully I will have made the point that what Trinidad experienced is not translatable to the broader Caribbean, thankfully. But I think it's also useful to mention that the contemporary portrait of Trinidad's political environment is one in which the Jamaat al-Muslimin, that was the group spearheading the coup attempt, although they won victories, even legal victories, at one point the governor had to pay them compensation for wrongful arrests. They are not as militant, as vocal and activistic and the harsh reality of the messaging that led many people to be recruited, including children from Trinidad, the messaging that says, come, you got paradise to help build. When they got to the land of promised paradise, turned out it was not what they were sold. A lot of them now are mad at the Trinidad government because they're not bringing them back with the speed that they would hope. So I think there's a good news. There's a historical lesson in Trinidad. And there's an explanation of that unique set of circumstances, which for me 
has elements of good news to the broader Caribbean in that I don't find the circumstances there as replicable or expandable. And you also have to ask the question, where else in the Caribbean are there relatively large pockets of Muslims? Guyana has them, Suriname has them, but there's been no trekking from Guyana to the Middle East. There's been no trekking from Suriname to the Middle East. It is the circumstances of the Jamaat al muslimin and allied groups, their activism, their zealotry, a zealotry that is not replicated in other places where there are either small or not so small groups of people who follow the Islamic religion. That's good news. But it could be replicated, right? Because there's nothing intrinsically stopping, for example, a similar type movement from happening in Guyana. It's a very large Muslim population. Or even if it's a small number, like in Barbados, they're becoming a much more coherent group in Barbados. I remember I saw the last year how many like pro Gaza protests, for example, in Barbados of all places. So there, there is potential risks there. And also because now in 2024 to link to the cyber issue, you can just sit at your home in YouTube for hours and hours on end and get essentially radicalized in some way. And then you want to go to Syria or Middle East. And I don't think Caribbean governments are taking any kind of interest in this issue. They have many other things to think about, but it doesn't seem to be at least not even a top 50 of potential problems. Mm -hmm. You're quite right that the age of technology has been an enabler of radicalization in a variety of ways. But what I think is important to keep in mind is that the radicalization, Trinidad and other places that would be involved in a recruitment trek has to have some organizational dynamics to it. They aren't as far as I know any mosques in Guyana or Suriname with the same zealotry of organizing to go and fight on behalf of the Prophet Muhammad in ISIL. So I think, yes, the potential is there, the radicalization, but absent the organizational nexus to the ideology that may be inculcated online, I think the chances of having that kind of movement organized movement. I tell the, the places in the book, in the chapter, where their organizations were happening in the mosque in certain parts of Trinidad and Tobago. I don't find Guyana to be a hotbed, even a cobalt bed or Suriname in that same way. So coming to the end, I want to ask this kind of broader question. Who is ultimately responsible for coming to a solution to the primarily narco trafficking issue in the Caribbean Sea? Because one could argue it primarily has a negative effect on South America and North America. Obviously it has collateral negative effects in the Caribbean, but I think perhaps not as much on net. Of course, Trinidad and Jamaica would say otherwise. But even then, the Caribbean countries themselves don't have the resources, talent, expertise, good on the list to actually solve it. How do we come to a solution where there are separate legal jurisdictions, but one particular transnational problem? The simple answer is solving is not amenable to any one nation or one jurisdiction or in one region. About two decades ago, I was part of a I think there were four of us in the United States. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime organized this conference to do a global assessment of narcotics. We met in London. There were four of us in the United States. And when we were hearing the reports about the challenges of narcotics and the crime arms in Vietnam, in Australia, in South Africa, in Slovakia, I remember we met, a couple of us went for a drink the first night. I said, my God, we thought we had it that bad in the Caribbean and North America. Out there in a world that we may not necessarily hear about, unless you follow the International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, and the Global Cocaine Report every year, there is a massive expanse of criminality related to drugs. Not easy for any one jurisdiction to solve it. But I think there's some potential helping to attenuate the situation. I make the argument in the book, in looking at the drugs chapter, 
What Caribbean jurisdictions have begun to do ever since the CARICOM Marijuana Commission recommendation began to be implemented, ever since the United States, those 48 states in the District of Columbia have legalized certain quantities of marijuana, is helping in that the definition of the problem is now being redefined, where you're not arresting, you're not complicating your prisons by young people arrested for a spiff for planting a little patch of ganja. So I think the redefinition of what is the problem in relation to marijuana is creating a greater scope for the systems in the Caribbean and other jurisdictions to have a little less ease of the pressure. They can now devote more attention to the challenges of the cocaine, of the ecstasy, of the other hard drugs, that in some respect. But I say, I make the point in the book, that in itself is not going to relieve the pressure on the Caribbean because it is still located where it is. The cocaine is still coming out of South America. You have, using my CSIS hat, there was part of a conversation last year, cocaine trafficking to Europe. It's scary what's happening in Sweden, the Netherlands, Spain, Germany. France. The demand is still there. The supply is still there. The Caribbean is still there. So you'll have a continuous challenge of managing the transshipment. But many Caribbean jurisdictions no longer have to worry about devoting prosecutorial attention to arresting a group of guys who have two marijuana cigarettes. And I provide the evidence in the book for Trinidad and Tobago, where the Attorney General identified how many people in the prisons for small quantities of marijuana are going to be released. Not only is that an individual freedom reality for certain citizens, but it is a release of the economic valve pressure for the state to take care of its citizens and other citizens in its prisons. I had a book told when that drugs and security book first came out in 97. I remember the, the chief of prisons in Aruba saying to me, he said, Professor Griffith, this drug trafficking thing is giving a great world geography lesson to my prison officers. We never know that certain countries exist, but we have people from all these countries that we never heard about involved in trafficking, arrested and find themselves before our courts. So I think unless that global demand and global supply are lowered significantly. You're always going to have Caribbean countries featuring in the transshipment, particularly on the cocaine and the methamphetamines and so on. The drugs need to be shipped through the Caribbean to get to the ultimate demand for this? They, they don't need to be shipped through the Caribbean. The drugs are moved in several different ways. Some is by container that do not go through the Caribbean across the Atlantic. Some is by individual couriers. Some is by yachts. It's a nightmare for St. Vincent and the Grenada managing the yachts, but some go by submersibles. But it is cheaper in some ways to pay off Caribbean, either port security or army or police, relatively cheap. So you find a way to move it in quantities to the Caribbean where the cost of doing business is lower than if you have to, and some people still do, use the containers moving from one part of the world to the next. You had a shipment of, of arms intended for the Dominican Republic arrested in Senegal two years ago, September 22, August 2022. A guy in a flagship doing other shipping. But hey, we can put something other than the regular cargo and move it circuitously. They were caught in Senegal, but it's not only to the Caribbean. And I suspect that will continue for a good while. While provided the supply and demand are there. There was a time when I lived in Florida, there was an annual Western Hemisphere Strategy Conference. And I still remember the then head of the United States Department of State Office of Drugs giving a keynote luncheon address, basing the South Americans for sending all their poison to us. And the main Peruvian legislators stood up. She said, let me ask you a question. If we're sending you our poison, why do you want poison? The point she was making is that there is a demand and supply relationship. 
we're not just sending this, as you call it, poison. We're sending this poison because you are consuming the pumps. So you have to fracture that demand-supply relationship, which is easier said than done, to be able to attenuate the problem significantly. Should a country like, let's say, Barbados request underground assistance from, for example, USA, DEA, or other enforcement agencies to operate in Barbados? Or would that be some kind of far-flung, high-profile idea that's not plausible? The underground operation, the underground support is already happening. It's been happening for a while. It's not expedient for the politicians to make big public news about it. But whether Barbados or any other Caribbean country does not have the capabilities. You just take one element. I heard a powerful message from Prime Minister Mia Motley recently talking about the crime, the responsibility to not leave everything to the police. Guns increasingly involved in homicides in the Caribbean, Barbados included. The United States has been providing traffic tracing for a long time now. The ability of many Caribbean countries, Barbados included, to do what's needed necessitates reliance upon other jurisdictions, including the United States. The RSS, where Barbados is not only the headquarters, but for a long time, before the advent of Guyana, it paid the single largest portion of the bill. If you take a look at what the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative is, much of the support goes to the RSS, helping Barbados, helping the other jurisdictions. So that support is there in a variety of ways. It doesn't make public news, but it is there from the British, there from the French, there from the, the Dutch, and so on. What's perhaps the single or top three most important things that the Caribbean government should do to try to get these issues for example, in Barbados, Jamaica is a different situation, granted. Try to get these issues a bit more under control to decrease the challenges to their sovereignty. That's a complex basket. You've got to disaggregate the elements in the basket. Well, let me take one of the elements in the basket. One of the elements in the basket is connected to the link between the drugs and the crime. And the link between the drugs and the crime has for a number of years now been allowing a spiraling homicides in many jurisdictions. Thankfully, in the last two years, last year, homicide rate in Jamaica has begun to decline. Same thing in Trinidad and Tobago. But as I've said so many times, including most recently in Washington, D.C., the solution to the crime problem cannot be put purely at the doorstep of the police. Solving crime has to be a community, a citizenry engagement. I got a good friend right here in New York, Tony Best. I don't know if Tony Best, distinguished journalist, many decades. Tony called me a couple of weeks ago. I've lot the people in, I'm not going to call it part of Barbados company. What, what does the government need to do to stop all the crime? I said the people in, in X need to exercise agency. So many times when the police is called, nobody wants to give the evidence. So many times when even for domestic violence, which is a problem also in Barbados and other places, the police show up, the woman change her mind. Unless the citizens themselves begin to exercise agency. How might they do something in their churches? How might they do something in their civic organizations? How can they do something other than simply saying the police? And the same people who complain that they're not enough police don't want to pay taxes to be able to fund the police or the army. So I think part of the solution lies with agency being exercised by communities not simply reliance on the police or the army, because ultimately there's only so much the police can do. And I like to remind people that the problem of criminality is not only a police engagement. You have to ask yourself, what's happening with the courts, the backlog of cases there? You have to ask yourself, what's happening in the prisons? I don't know if you read the chapter, we write, lay out the prison overcrowding Rashid. Or Abedas has the least crowding. I invoke Fyodor Dostoevsky, who said, if you want to know what a civilization thinks of itself, take a peek into its prisons. How can you expect so large a proportion of your population between 18 and 35, their most productive ages, to be incarcerated for whatever period and come out without rehabilitation of a significant kind? to be productive citizens. I like to constantly, as a refrain, say, the problem of the crime part of this 
matrix is not to be left only to the police or the army. Citizens have got to exercise agency in their communities. And I was happy to hear Prime Minister Miyamati saying it last night. You see a kid get all this fancy, expensive phone, where they get it from? You're not giving it to them. They're not working to get it. You've got to do something to understand and deal with the circumstance in your life. Don't just leave it to the police. Dr. Griffiths, this has been another very insightful conversation, and I thank you for joining me once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Good luck with all the podcasting. Keep up the good work. That's it for this episode. For updates about the podcast, please subscribe to our Substack blog found on cpsi.media. You can also read our newsletters and long-form content on Caribbean policy improvements.